Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Uh, my name is Gideon Munoz, and I have the honor of sharing the Torah portion with you guys for this week. It is found in Genesis 28:10 uh, through chapter 32, verse 2. And the name of the portion is Vayetze, um, which is the Hebrew word for the phrase, he went out. Um, the portion actually kicks off, it's a very known portion. Um, it kicks off with Jacob leaving uh, Beersheba and heading towards Haran. Um, and on that way, on his way, he came to a place and he stayed the night. Um, and then God appeared to him in a dream. Um, the Lord in that dream reiterated to him the promise that he made with, with Abraham and Isaac that he will keep him wherever he goes and guide his people into the promised land. Um, I thought that it was really incredible that the passage starts out by taking the time to point out that Jacob came to a certain place, a specific place. Um, and the Hebrew there is better translated as he arrived at the, the place, um, which to me immediately rang a bell when you think about the place that God, uh, a specific place. In this case, um, the sages unanimously agree uh, for the most part that this specific place was actually Mount Moriah which when you think about it is the same place where, where Abraham was ready to sacrifice Isaac. It is the exact same place where David would then set up the threshing floor. And then even more than that, uh, the same place that Solomon builds the temple. So it was the very place where Adonai had chosen to place his name and reveal himself in a specific and special way. So what a more fitting place for God to continue revealing of himself um, and his, the descendants of Abraham than this place specifically where Jacob finds himself. Um, even the stone that Jacob uses as a pillow, which is crazy to me to think about. I am very particular about my pillow, um, but to think of putting an actual rock as a pillow and sleeping makes no sense to me, but this is what Jacob does. But even the pillow that he uses, so this stone is one of the stones of that place, is a foreshadowing um, of the stone that is going to be used in the temple. Um, and as most likely in this case, exactly the same location. So a foreshadowing of a stone, one of those stones that will be used to build a temple is the stone that he laid on, but also the stone that he uses um, to make that temporary altar, to be able to, to, to make an offering unto the Lord. And now the portion continues with the story of Jacob, of how Jacob marries Rachel, well, Leah and Rachel in that order. Um, Jacob falls completely in love with Rachel. Um, sight, you know, it was, it was one of the first ever recorded love at first sight. Um, and he would do anything to marry her. So of course, Laban being Rachel's father gives him this offer of, you can take uh, Rachel, my daughter, if you work for me for seven years. Um, we know the story. After seven years has passed, he tricks him and gives him uh, Leah and Seth, his eldest, and I always like, it blew my mind thinking about that switcheroo, just how it actually takes place. But I, one thing to notice is that right before the actual wedding, Jacob th or Jacob Laban threw a huge feast. Um, and there was probably drinking involved and most likely in my mind, that's definitely what also aided and, uh, and helped Lab Laban's devious plan to switch um, Leah and Rachel, uh, but his excuse, of course, was that it was the local tradition that um, the younger cannot marry before the firstborn. So this was obviously an interesting twist also in the story when you think about the divine uh, decree that about Esau and Jacob that God gave where the older will, will serve the younger. So in this case, it was kind of a twist, an ironic twist for him where instead of uh, that being given to him in this sense, um, he flipped it around and Rachel actually had to wait seven more years um, where Jacob worked in order to get her. Um, but yeah, so Jacob ends up working an additional seven years for Rachel um, because of his love for her. It seemed like, seemed like it was nothing, um, even though it was 14 years. But this obviously, again, sets up what I call the bad juju <laughs> uh, that represents a multiple wife situation in the Bible. I feel like every single time there's a multiple wife involved, um, chaos erupts. Um, but in this case, you also throw in the fact that each 
each uh, sister in this case also had maid servants that mother's son so it became this crazy mess um, but in that Leah gave birth to Reuben Simeon Levi Judah Issachar uh, Zebulun and Dinah and and then Zilpah Leah's servant gave birth to Gad and Asher and then Rachel's servant gave birth to Dan and Naphtali and then Rachel gave birth just to Joseph in this portion but later on to, to Benjamin. Um, the portion comes towards an end where Jacob finally uh, realizes he's been in, 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 in that land for 14 years and wants to return home uh, but Laban persuades him to remain um, offering him sheep as payment uh, for his labor. Um, it's crazy just seeing how uh, Laban's always swindling, always trying to find ways, but it's also funny who he's doing it to, Jacob, the literal swindler. Um, but uh, they, they come up with this you know, sheep speckled, spotted debacle. Um, but then Jacob continues to prosper and continues to to uh, gain wealth um, and finally sneaks off, uh, takes off and Laban pursues him but God tells him, you know, God tells Laban not to harm him in the dream um, and they finally make a pact at Mount Gal Ed um, with the pile of stones and they go their separate ways um, where Jacob continues proceeding to the Holy Land. So that was a portion um, for me, one of the biggest things that I saw in this and that, I, that I'm con continuing to see more and more of late is God's overarching grace and mercy. Um, because you look at this story as a perfect, another perfect example in, in the Bible of God, of us humans failing. Um, these aren't just like even regular humans. These are like our patriarchs. These are the people that we pray, you know, when we bless our kids, uh, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Rachel, Leah, but you look painstakingly through these people's lives and they are, they have failure upon failure, um, misstep upon misstep and sin upon sin, like consistently throughout the portion, and especially this portion. But what you also see is God's grace, God's mercy through it all. So as we are um, falling as we are sinning, God is showing mercy and grace to us. God using people like us. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's just an incredible thing to see um, that no matter what we do, uh, ultimately God's in control and God will bless us and God wants to use us. But we have to truly fall at the mercy of His grace. Um, because it is only through his strength, through his mercy, through his grace that we are able to prevail, that we are able to do what we are, we are called to do. Um, not only that, but as a father, it, it, it puts the onus on me. Um, I feel like it's crazy. I, I tell people this all the time, but how hard I feel like I am on my kids and what I expect of them to do. And, 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 and when they fail, you know, an eight-year-old, four-year-old, a five-year-old, I that just, I have a tendency to be hard on them or to expect something that, and I look back at how God has treated me, how God continues to show mercy and grace to me. It's perplexing. Um, it's incredible. And it is only by his grace that I'm even, even able to, to, to live out this life right now. But it makes me realize how important it is for us to do the same, to show God's grace, to allow God's grace to be reflected through us, his mercies to be reflected through us, to others, to our children, to our wives. Are we showing grace um, when they are failing? Uh, when I myself am a flawed human, when you look at the grace in this portion that God has shown over and over again, the blessings that God has bestowed on his people despite their sins, despite their failures, um, it is, it's, it's incredible to watch, but at the same time, it also should spur us to take God's grace that he offers and, and, and through his grace, being able to do what he calls us to do, knowing that he will bless us. Um, but also knowing that when we fail, if we fail to not get in that wallowing of self-pity, um, to not get in that wallowing of, 
you know, woe is me because of where I am, but knowing that God has given us the grace to be able to stand back up. Like he says, a righteous man falls seven times, but gets back up again. Um, and in this time, in this climate, I feel like it's so important for us to realize God's grace. It's there. It's here. It was there in the beginning. It was there with, with our patriarchs, with our founding, you know, the fathers of our faith. And it is here for us now, that same grace for us to be able to get up and walk again. Um, but it is also the same grace that we need to bestow to others and give to others and show mercy to others in this time. So um, that is what I got out of the Torah portion. Thank you.